Hey guys, how's everybody doing today? Great. So welcome to our entrepreneurial workshop series. Um, I'm going to say thank you to Terry from the foundation for helping us arrange our speakers that are coming out today. Uh, we have Chris from PMX Agency who's here today. He is an ESU alum. He grew up in the Pennsylvania area and uh, is now the co-CEO of the marketing firm out of New York City that's been around for 29 years. And so he's here to share uh, his knowledge with you guys. So welcome, Chris. Thank you again. I didn't even do anything yet. You're fine. Thank you so much. I won't have to do much to get another clap, I guess, right? Thanks for the tie. Appreciate it. So I'm wearing mine today for Terry. If I wore ties every day with the folks that I work with, eventually they'd probably I'd get pushed out or something. Things have changed. Well, I'm really happy to be here. I'm really excited to, I guess, be up here and tell you some war stories and answer questions and give you some perspective on what I've learned painfully. And I'll go as, I'll say this, but I'll go as deep as you want, but you just have to ask me. I'll get to a point, and if you want me to go further, I'll tell you how, how good or bad something was and share with whatever you're looking for that can help you with your inspiration and your ideas on game. He is recording it. My only, my only requirement is this won't be on NBC News tonight. <laughs> that is correct. I'm going to be there. Oh, um, and if I can ask you guys to just keep your phones away during this presentation. We can send you a package. I guarantee it would be on. Help me, if you would, I've got wires hanging out back here. Help me quickly. No bios because we'll run out of time if you don't like it. But I'd love your name, and just tell me as briefly as you can either what you the, the business idea. Don't pitch me. Just like what are you doing? What are you working on? This big, as pithy as you can possibly make it. This is the pitch process, right? Yeah. Pitching ideas. Um, what are you interested in, and why are you here? Why are you in this class? It'll just help me talk about the things that would be helpful to you. You're squinting, so you're first. I'm, I'm just here to learn. I have no business ideas. I work in the building, and okay. I work with Keith, so I like to listen to lectures. What you know about entrepreneurship is what? It's, it's a my complex business. process. It's a com many movie parts. Okay. Sorry. It's a complex process of many movie parts. A lot of people start there. But if you don't mind, let's just quickly go around the room. What's your name? And just kind of, what are you passionate about? Uh, Cash. We'll come back to cash later. <laughs> 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 right. 
we'll come back to cash. We said that three times so far. That's going to be a thing. Yeah, I'm Audrey Bailey Hopper, and my brother Juan and I have been working on this project, and we're here in the Innovation Center um, with Spring Fresh and Joy Gifts yeah. and the Associates. Okay. Saving lives. Yes. I like that. Saving lives. Hey, so. Connors uh, from UD Health. I have a SaaS platform called Access We Care. It allows anybody to navigate vulnerable individuals to the most appropriate health and social services. Uh, we align medical care with social determinants of health, for which I was nominated for the National Medal of Innovation and Technology. Bravo. That's fantastic. Please. I'm Laura Sperindus. Again, your name? One more time. Laura. Laura. Okay. I'm marketing faculty, and um, I promote music events and start something with uh, making merchandise for, for music. Making merchandise for music? Okay, we'll talk about music a little bit too. Great, sir? Uh, Mike Marino, I work for the Greater Pocono Chamber of Commerce and i um, here to support Keith and uh, businesses in general. Um, I think most of these are startups, but you know, the Chamber is here to support business. Great, so he's here to help lower your taxes. <laughs> for those of you, just in case it wasn't clear, support you and help your taxes go down. Kind of right. Together we're stronger, and then we. Can <laughs> <laughs> Bravo! That's that. fantastic. Thank you so much. Seriously, small businesses don't survive without him. A lot of times, people don't recognize it's true. The Chamber of Commerce is everything, particularly in a small business, where no one takes your call, no one will support you and you never have enough time or help to get your work done. So be thankful seriously. Please, sir. Uh, my name is Menon Barty. I work for Marathon Studios. <coughs> Marathon Studios and Tick Check. I'm a software developer. Okay. Great. Software development. Keep going. My name is Alexander Schmidt. I'm an exchange student from Germany. I'm here to study or learn. Okay. We're in Germany? Stuttgart. Great. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Michael Weiss. I'm interested in online marketing and I'm here to learn as well. Online marketing? I know something about that. But somewhere that'll come up today, I'm sure. Please go ahead. Uh, my name is Joseph Fitzgerald. I'm currently doing an internship with ESU's greatest design agency, uh, <laughs> New Mind Design, and I'm a graphic designer. Just, just here to learn. So, graphic designer, you all three know each other in the category, yeah, kind of? Uh, you all do. Oh, cool. All right. Go ahead. I'm Brendan Riley. I'm also part of my I'm a graphic designer and a, a freelance designer and artist. Great. Yeah. That's great. I'm glad you're here. We need more of you. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, my name is Demetrius Guzman. I'm also a part of the NewMind team and uh, also a graphic designer, <coughs> graphic design major. Okay. Please. My name is Siraj Herbshad and I'm a server worker. Okay. Um, my name is Nathan Orgy. Gotcha. Um, my name is Brady Campbell, and I'm just here to learn. Okay. Just broadly or specifically? Well, I eventually want to become a healthcare administrator. So there I want it to learn is. More about, like, the okay. It's always the second question that's the right answer. <laughs> Sometimes the complex answer we had from our friend over here, it's the ninth question actually is the one that nobody asks first. Go ahead. My name is Olivia Hoffberg. Okay. Great. Hospitality. Should I keep going or do you want to participate or you're learning too? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for doing that. It just, I do this a lot and I got really lucky in business and I've worked really hard for all my luck. But the reason, the only reason I'm in business and the only reason I'm an entrepreneur has nothing to do with marketing, although I love it. It has 100% to do with people, not 99, 100. And we'll talk about that and why that makes a difference, particularly for online marketing and growing and getting sales and getting new customers. Um, but I got very lucky in my path and my choices along the way. Um, so quick rewind, I did go to ESU. I grew up in Coopersburg. That's it. Nobody knows Coopersburg. <laughs> It's, it's that big, um, and uh, I'm a speech pathologist, an audiologist with a psych minor, and I guess I decided that when I got a phone call from a friend of a friend that his head salesperson in New York City had died, 
and he offered me the job. I thought that would be a good idea. I guess I can take a job in New York. I had never been to New York. But I was working in, um, I don't know what it's called now. It used to be at Allentown Sacred Heart. Is it Lehigh Valley <laughs> Medical <laughs> Center? Yeah, it's about Lehigh Valley. Yeah. It's still at Sacred Heart Hospital. So I was working with stroke patients and trauma patients, the kids that would crash motorcycles and snowmobiles and all kinds of things, that would lose their speech and lose their language. And what I learned there was the only way I could actually help them was to understand the human, which sounds so cliche for anything medical, but profoundly underscore is really the takeaway. And in entrepreneurship and in anything innovative and in anything new, the word profound is really, really important. So my pathway took me to New York. I worked for this gentleman that owned a small um, marketing company in New York. He was evil. Everybody should work with someone evil in their career. He was a really bad guy. But I learned a lot and he let me do everything. My first experience in being an entrepreneur was working for Ted. And I'm a, I'm a big guy, but I'm a lot smaller than I used to be when I went here. And uh, I was there about three months and he said, we're going to go get our money. I'm a kid from Pennsylvania. Everybody's nice and pleasant. I didn't actually know what that meant. So he said, I'm going to go get I'm going to go get my money. You should come with me. So I said, sure. Let's, you know, I'm going to go get money. So he said, this guy owes me 17 grand. We're going to go get my money. So now I'm kind of processing, like, maybe the football thing is going to work out. But being big may be helpful. I'm like, I just started working with this guy. And uh, so he came in, and he said, the gentleman's name, is he here today? And she said, no. And he said, he is. I know he's here. I can see him. So he said, come on, we're going to get him. I swear to God, this is true. Now I'm in the middle of a Godfather movie, basically. <laughs> and he said, we're going to go get him. So I'm like, OK, let's go get him. And so he said to the guy, you owe me 17 grand. And the guy said, I don't owe you 17 grand, and I'll skip the profanity. And I won't do it. He grabbed his phone, and he lifted over his head, and he said, get out of my office. Now, you have a couple of choices. I'm the get him guy. <laughs> right? <laughs> have a couple of choices. Most of them start with the word no, and then I saw two bigger guys come in and they helped me out of the office. So <laughs> clearly, this guy had money problems. Cash, right? We said that four times so far. Cash is everything. So uh, anyway, I left that guy <laughs> after that scene, and then I moved out to New Jersey. I worked for another company where a husband and wife team owned the company. Sister brother? Yeah. Any of you husband and wife? Don't do it. I still have my wife after 34 years, uh, and, but we learned that after about six months. That was a really good idea because you don't get to have both usually. Um, but I worked for a husband and wife. It was a, not a good situation. They were brilliant marketers, and I learned everything at that young age about what I could about marketing. I learned a lot from them in, in five years, so I'm very grateful about that. But if you ever get offered to work for a company that's owned by a husband and wife and they're both there, I'd pass. There's a lot of other companies that you can have choices. Um, it's just complicated. And you're not in the family. So, so I, I went there and honestly after the get me guy and the two of them, I just, I just didn't want to do it anymore. I just didn't want to work for people that didn't care about people. And I just said, I quit. And. Uh, so I called my wife and I said, I think I want to start this business. And I didn't really know too many people in New York. But my wife, Angela, came with me. And my really only friend in New York's name is Angelo. So you're getting something here that most of the people I know are Italian, <laughs> at least in my early, early career. And we're jewelers, which is kind of unusual. But Angelo and I started the company. And so our core business, and I'll go to the, some slides in a second, um, is all around marketing and all around marketing to consumers and getting brands and people connected. So whether it's business to consumer or business to business, even if you're selling to businesses, it's still those businesses' customers that are actually using your service. You're cleaning their air, right? The people who pay you, that's just your check payer. Those are not actually your customers. And so figuring, figuring out who's my customer in a profound way who are they? Where do they live? What are they interested in? What are they passionate about? 
What do they wear? How do they talk? Where are they from? What's their background? How many kids? What house? No kids? Do they have a car? Do they drive? I mean, all of that information, data, is really, really important. In the old school way, you just asked a lot of questions over many, many years and eventually you accumulated knowledge. Now we can know like that. So marketing, design, has fundamentally changed because we can know a lot about people very, very quickly. And so that has changed marketing and changed business. And so I was saying earlier uh, to Keith that what I did really well with my partner is just follow the bouncing ball. I started off in offline marketing, and then email came out, and then search came out, and then Google launched, then Yahoo kind of gave way to Google, then Facebook came out, and, 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 and I just kept following it. And so our capabilities now range from digital media, online marketing, offline marketing, content creation, social creation, creative design, all around trying to solve usually just a few challenges. Who's my customer? How do I get more of them? How do I grow in whatever form that means? More customers, more revenue, more profit, more cash. How do I have the right products or services to match my customer or my audience? That's pretty much it. If I'm a lawyer and I'm trying to solve a lawsuit, I'm solving a different problem. But what does the lawsuit usually have to do with? People and money. Right? So it still is going to come down to people and money. And so I started the company, sorry if I just bumped your wire there. I started the company because I really like problem solving. I had an amazing partner and a wife who would tolerate me um, and, and was able to get some really fantastic clients. So Time Inc. is a big client, Nike is a big client, Converse is a big client, um, the North Face, we just landed Louis Vuitton last week. So we have these great brands, and they all have similar challenges, which is I sell luxury or shoes or, or, or fashion or we work with Service Master, which is probably a competitor of yours, which they clean and restore and all kinds of activities in the home. Still the same basic questions. So that's my background. The rest of it I'll weave throughout the conversation. Where's the clicker? Got it. So that's us, Consumer Driven Performance Agency. There's 300 of us across eight, across eight offices in the US. We're about to merge with a global company, which will make us 700 in a bunch of countries and more numbers, whatever. But it's essentially taking our business and going global. So we're engineering that deal and then a bunch of awards and things, which I can send you this if you want. This is important, 70% now market and communicate with their customers across channel. And if you think about your own life, most of it is driven by this. In five years, you will not be walking around with this. So those of you who are app developers, don't stop here. You've seen voice and where voice is going. 50% of all voice, of all searches will be voice in the next two years, which means we don't need that anymore. We don't need really Google for Think how crude that is. Search, text, pop-up. I mean, it's going to evolve very, very quickly. Um, and so we have size and scale that we can work any with anybody. That's really the point. That takes about 20 years to get that, at least for me, because <coughs> I didn't take any outside capital. And I didn't really, I just didn't want to go into that movie of having to owe somebody money all the time. A little bit different now, because I did take an investor on in uh, July of 2016, but just the logo bingo here. What's interesting is that we've never specialized, and so you have, you know, Mattress Firm used to be Sleepies, and a bunch of other brands as a client, Samsonite, HP, Hewlett Packard, Nike, Ace Hardware, a bunch of brands you probably know in here. Edgewell is about 18 brands. P&G up here? No, P&G is a client. They have a bunch of different brands from Crest to Dove to Head and & Shoulders and all kinds of brands like that. What do you think is the biggest disruptor to uh, consumer product businesses today? Right on. Amazon. 
70% of people search first on Amazon. They may not stay there and get it there, but they go there first. Why? Go ahead. Cheaper. Why else? Get it next day. Yep, reviews, absolutely. It's just easier. And what, what was Amazon's big advantage versus Walmart until about a month ago? Again? Good memory, they lost that benefit. <laughs> yeah, they lost that benefit. They now pay taxes everywhere. Uh, that's definitely a strength, yep. No stores. Now they have stores. Any, you guys going to Manhattan at all? Yeah. Go to the, M I'm sorry? Uh, it's in Amazon Go, it's now called. So Amazon Go, a top selling products on Amazon. No salespeople. There's a lovely young woman who stands in the front and says, welcome to Amazon. <laughs> That's the extent of the human interaction. Everything else you do yourself, scan, swipe, you know, because you've got Amazon on your phone, right? That's it, you're out in five minutes. Talk about, and there's gonna be 5,000 of them. Talk about disruptive. So Walmart has been winning in lots of ways on the profit side because they have stores. When you don't have stores as a competitive difference and now it's all about your relationship with your customer and trust, it's gonna be a very interesting, fun challenge to watch Amazon Walmart compete. Where's the Amazon store? It is on Prince off of Houston. Do you all sell the product? Yep. Change it every day. Products change every day. Whatever is best selling today, that's what gets in tomorrow. Yeah, it's not a great experience if you're walking in to get, you know, feel like, the, boy, this is a great environment. It's bad lighting and you're in and out. But that's Amazon, you know. <laughs> Excuse me. So this is who we are, a consumer first performance marketing agency. What are we? So what differentiates us? This, these relentless, transformative, and data driven, talk about that a little bit, is very much who we are. These five definitions or words kind of define who we are with the creativity piece at the end. That's the music part. That if it's just trying to solve everything with math and data without creativity, no one cares. You have to connect in the heart. Even Amazon, despite that distilled kind of <laughs> sterile environment, we just defined all those things that are special about Amazon. That's why we identify with that brand. You wouldn't say, oh, I go there because they treat me like a king or a queen. Amazon, they treat you like a king or a queen only because they can give you what we just said. Faster shipping, cheaper prices, it's easier to get, I can get it tomorrow. And then our culture um, very much driven by that customer service, uh, customer first. So we just started working with Hugo Boss. You all heard of Hugo Boss? So the head of marketing said to me on Monday, he said, here's how, it, here's how I would define working for us. And this is what I care about. It's not here, by the way. He said, when you walk by my store when I'm closed and the windows are dirty, I want you to text me. Now, I still haven't figured out whether he actually meant it, because Hugo Boss has a lot of stores. But what he meant was the details matter. The details are everything. And you, those of you that design or code, you know how important those minor details are when people are passionate about something. And it really struck me when he said that to me that that's where we are now as a consuming society. We care about everything. And we're in charge. Consumers own it, not the brands. It's all about us. I took investment from the Stagwell Group in July 2016. Our company, I'm still a majority owner of it, but we are part of a network of a bunch of other brands. So we now have the, the scale to work with every, anybody everywhere with a, a major um, footprint across the globe. So I always wanted that and um, I wanted very, very small investment group and a lot of money because um, I just didn't want the complications of too many people and a board that didn't care. So I have two investors. Uh, one is Mark Penn. Mark is the 
He is the, the, effectively the CEO of the Stagwell Group. Mark worked f uh, for the Clintons. He worked for a variety of different global public political figures and put them in office. Very, very brilliant guy. Um, contemptuous, for sure. Um, but he totally pushes us to get better, and that's exactly why I took um, that's why I took the money. And the second investor is Steve Ballmer, who's one of the co-founders of Microsoft. So having these two guys, what I really wanted was money so I could buy some stuff, and I wanted, my, I wanted people to take my call. The head of p and is not calling me back. As much as I think I'm good at my job, he's not calling me back. But now I get called back. Steve doesn't make a call for me, but he certainly helps. I'll just get by this. Just some interesting factoids. I'm sure you know this. We use our phones a lot more, and TV's going down. But what's happening in TV? Again? Right. So classic linear TV is going down, but connected TV, I can be watching a show in two seconds. Think about your TV. As much as we have more content and all this access, it's still a pain in the neck. You've got to go upstairs, you have to sit down, you get the clicker, somebody's arguing, you flip it on, I don't know what channel, what's on, what's not. You talk, for most of us, it's two minutes on a phone, on a TV. I'm instantly where I want to be. The same has happened to billboards. How have billboards changed? I'm sorry? They're digital. They're, digital. They're, always, changing. They're always changing, right? So you go down. You go down the highway, you go down Route 80, right? 80 or 78. You go by the billboard, it says one thing, and just as you're going by, it flips. <laughs> Terry had asked me earlier, how long does it stay on? And I said, well, it depends how much you want to pay. Certain things, if I'm selling ER services, you've seen it, right? ER services, and they say waiting time at the ER. I don't need to wait very long. You don't have to convince me, hmm, what's an ER room or ER service? I know what that is. But if I'm selling something more complicated, plastic surgery, diet plans, it takes a little bit longer. But again, we're only, depending how fast you're driving and how much you blink, I mean, you're talking about a second to, I don't know, five seconds. So what used to be old fashioned and legacy is coming back because it's getting digitized and creating lots of interesting opportunities. This is huge. This is why graphic designers and creatives will always have a job. It has to be personal. It can't be bots. As much as that's going on right now, bots are getting challenged not only because of the political environment, but also because we don't want to talk to bots. For certain things, it's absolutely appropriate. For the most basic when it, you know, what's the shipping, what's the shipping date for my new whatever? I don't need a human for that. But personalization is critically important. Google and Facebook get 70% of every advertising dollar. Seven, zero. Now that's shifting and fading. Google's in my office every day. They have new services, new, com new functionality they didn't have yesterday. So when you now or later search on Google, you don't have to log in to manage your history. You can just delete right in the Google search box. So if you type in something you didn't mean to or something you did and you just don't want anybody to see it, go down to the bottom, advanced settings, search delete, pick a day or forever. Do Google does not have that data. And that's because of the Facebook screw up and the European laws changing with uh, privacy. So Zuckerberg t pushed it too far by using people's data, and they came out and said, you have to give the consumer control over their data. So it's a good thing. Con consumers first. That's the world we're in. And we mentioned ri the rise of Amazon. Just a little bit more, and then I'll jump to entrepreneurialism. But I often say assumptions are dangerous, conclusions are lethal. On my best day, on my best day I can remember, I've known about 50% of what I'm supposed to know. And then I wake up the next day and I know about 20. Every single day, 
the marketplace and the behaviors of consumers, all of us in this room, changes. Or something gets imposed on us. So that example I just gave you about Google, the only reason you know that is they're in my office every day. That is not public. That's a beta test that's happening right now. Tomorrow, and if I check my phone now, there's going to be something else that just changed that's going to fundamentally change my business. So I happened to, today's Thursday, Monday I sent, Tuesday, I sent a package to Mark, who heads up Stagwell, because um, I wanted to thank him for some contributions that he had made, an introduction that he had made. So I sent him a package. It had a letter, it had a very interesting, kind of clever way I packaged a quote that he made. And I sent a package to him to arrive yesterday. Think about what happened yesterday. How does that package handled yesterday versus one day earlier? So today, I called Mark, text Mark, <laughs> never answers. And I said, by the way, you're getting a package from me. I promise I didn't put a pipe bomb in there. <laughs> Please open it. I promise you it was from me. So the world just changed again. Not because I sent a package to Mark and had to call him, but what changed was not just one person got something in a mailbox in a package. However, I don't even know how many there are now, nine or eight, 10 or nine, eight. Eight. Everything changed. So communication with a package just changed. Every day things change. And so if you make conclusions about what's true, especially as an entrepreneur, you're dead. The only way you survive is constant movement and change and evolution and experimentation. So we put clients on two tracks. A core track, which is the keep doing what you're doing, make it a little bit better, grind out money, and the experimental track, which is the constant testing of new ideas, which is what happens here. Um, and thank God for this place and you, for real, because there's not enough experimentation. Everybody talks about it. Oh, we've got to try more things. If you go to most companies and they say, I'm going to give you a million dollars inside the company. I'm going to give you a million dollars to come up with the next great idea. Where do you think the, the million dollars go? If I work for a, a big company and someone says, you're in charge of new product development, I'm going to give you a million dollars. How much of that million dollars do you think actually goes to developing the new product? Anybody? About 20%. Where does it go? Desks, computers, people, overhead, unions, all the stuff that comes with big companies. They're good at certain things. They are terrible at experimentation. Check out the earnings of GE over the last 10 years. $500 billion lost in market cap. If you own GE 10 years ago, and you bought it for 100 bucks, it's now worth about 50. That's GE. They're selling their like light bulb business and some of the other basic core practices that they've no been known for is they can't make any money. I love when I hear these things. Amazon will never sell luxury goods. Really? The number one product on Amazon is Nike. The number one product for Nike is Air Jordans. The number one product for Air Jordans are Jordan 1s. 80% of all sneakers Nike sells are Jordan 1s. So what's happened now is luxury has become more available. And if you're a sneaker person, sneakers now affecting fashion. So Louis Vuitton just put $50 million into stadium goods. Stadium goods, you probably know, is a reseller of sneakers. The whole evolution has fundamentally changed so that she and he are the new luxury. I'm the new luxury, me, not Chris, but you, me, we. We are not controlled by brands or businesses. We're responsible for that relationship, whether it's B2B or B2C. And so we have obligations to protect our privacy now. We just assumed before Zuckerberg got in trouble that no one would ever misuse it. But now we find out all these things that we know, and I don't have to repeat it because I'm sure you know. How many of you know the Marco Polo app? Anybody seen it? So on your phone, I can have all my friends 
accessible on my phone. And I can press any one of them. And uh, I can communicate instantly with them live. Check it out. It's really cool. Very, very unknown at this point. Very, very well funded. I would expect this to blow up. P&G, I had a, at a dinner with a speaker. She was probably 21. And I brought her in to speak to our VIP clients. And I said, talk about how you do business with brands. But I said, specifically talk about when, some, when you don't like a brand or you don't like an experience, what do you do? She said, oh, I have 700 friends. I tell my 700 friends that I hate something. It's like Amazon um, <coughs> endorsements or comments. In her case, 700 people were, were told, I hate this experience. And she was using a nail salon. Um, she went to Cornell or something, yeah, Cornell. She hated a nail salon. So her 700 friends, let's just say they all have 100 friends. That's a lot of people. So the P&G person initially was thinking, you know, this technology is going to go away. And then he's doing the math while she's telling the story <laughs> and thinking, oh my god. Like if I sell bad shampoo and she hates it and she's telling 700 people and the 700 have 100 friends, that's a lot of people. That's the environment we live in now. Marco Polo? Yeah. It's, oh, because of Facebook Live, you're saying? Yeah. Because like I can have 700 people course. available yeah. instantly. Oh, okay. oh, it's, it's, it's all my phone. Just okay. If they're there, boom, they're right there. Instant, boom. It's like FaceTiming, but having everybody in your social circle available, if they're there, available. So it's changing the dynamic of how consumers and how we interact where we're that connected. Should I pause here, questions? Okay. Keep going, seriously. But do you have a question? That I can? No, we were just discussing how the similarities between that and Skype. Yeah, definitely. Yep. So what's happened is you're, I, I, I not only expect that you know me, I'm actually demanding that you know me. Otherwise, I won't do business with you. So how many of you know Stitch Fix? You stitch fix? They ask a lot of questions, right? Your favorite colors, your size, your style, all of those questions now, you're giving them that information. And guys just came out to guys stitch fix. Um, the expectation you have is I'm going to get what I love. That's, I'm gonna, I don't have to search for. It's going to fit because I told you this is what I want. If you don't like it, you just ship it back. This dynamic now between our expectation and what's possible, the close between our expectations and what data can enable is all right now. And so it's creating this tremendous opportunity, but lots and lots of data challenges and privacy challenges, challenges and regulations. Are we okay on time? How long do I have? We started like quarter after, right? Okay. Share with us, the better we're going to be able to style for them and personalize their experience. Um, but that's also a high bar that we have to live up to. Brands can't just say that, they have to live up to it. And so when a client tells us, like, I don't like purple, or I have too much of this, or I have something just like that, like, we need to be able to be capturing that information and be able to deliver a better experience with his or her feedback. Um, and, you know, I think that's not. So that's Katrina from Stitch Fix talking about the customer experience. And you saw the CEO of Nike and the CEO of Walmart. They're all saying the same thing. Even Macy's, they have a, which you can't really see very much, their, their business is actually doing extremely well. The new business, the legacy business, they're closing hundreds of Macy's stores because that legacy business, they just can't turn around. And I'm sure you've seen Sears is shutting all their stores. You have to keep up. And the consumer will take you there. I'll just go through this. And, um, and then pause. So the most handsome man in the world, maybe. Brad Pitts, that's a long time ago, but I'll tell you the story in a sec. Um, you know, it's incredibly handsome for all the right reasons. Uh, this is about Levi's. So 
Levi's 12 years ago, almost out of business. What's our favorite word? Favorite word is cash. They almost ran out of cash. Levi's ran out of cash. How many of you own Levi's? Most. You at least know the brand. Uh, just shout out, what, what's, what do you do in your Levi's? Anything particular? Anything different you do in your Levi's than any other pair of pants you have? Cut the grass. What do you do? You work, you sports. Anybody else have a Levi's story? Most people hang in them in some way, right? They're comfortable, they fit. Sometimes we have arguments with family and significant others because Terry was telling me the story earlier about having lots of holes, but he likes to cut his grass in those pants despite his wife's resistance. Get rid of those damn pants. <laughs> they don't fit you in their holes. Of course, holes are cool, so, you know, Terry, you're hip. Um, the CEO of Levi's came in and, and figured out pretty quickly they actually didn't know who their customer was. And they didn't know why people cared about Levi's. He thought they knew, and people thought they knew, but they don't really know. So if, if you have a business or you have an interest in a business, and somebody says, tell me about your customer, you do not have one customer. If you just think about Levi's, since we all know the brand, is that a Levi's jacket? Actually, it might be. Yeah, there you go. There's probably eight different customers. I have a Levi jacket just like that. I don't know you at all. I guarantee our lives have some similarities, but probably lots and lots of more differences, right? And that's just two of us, not the least of which is she's a woman and I'm a man. But eight different customers. So how on earth is a brand like Levi's going to learn who their customer is to save the company? And so what the CEO did is he went around the world, literally, and he found a woman in Africa that said, that's what I dance in. You've probably seen the ad, right? Probably the short, that's the longer version of it. What he found was, and he meant this as a metaphor, it's what I dance in. Now, in her case, and that's actually her, she danced in it. That's, those what, that's what she did in her Levi's. That's brand connection. When people talk about Harley Davidson, the percentage of people who own a Harley that tattoo their bodies with Harley Davidson, very, very high. Way over 50%. If you get someone put a tattoo on your body, that's a customer for life. <laughs> what's next closest to a tattoo? If you drive a car what's, or a vehicle, what's the next closest? A bumper sticker. You put a bumper sticker on, like you've seen the ones that said, you know, my kids of whatever in his kindergarten class or her <laughs> kindergarten class. Honor an honor student. Kind of proud of the school, right? We need more stickers, ESU stickers yeah. on cars. That's how people want to connect with brands. So I have, I'm a musician in another life, so I have lots of music, friends in, in music, and two of them just got off tour, and I said, what did you learn that was the most profound thing about being out on tour. And both of them had not been on tour in probably, I think, 10 years in one of them and seven or eight years in the other. This is around the globe. And they said the same thing. They've never felt an audience want, crave connection more. And it wasn't just, I love your music, oh my god, I love that song. It was, talk to me about who you are. Where'd that song come from? That's me, I see myself through that. Despite all of this communication and all this connection, what are we actually missing? And thank you so much for not having all your phones out. When you go back on campus, right, what do we all do? And what's the number one thing all of us have that nobody talks about? Not phones. Anything. What do all of us have that we never talk about that changes our life? Social media, yep. But how, how do we consume Social media, music, headphones. Think about how things have changed with headphones. Right? You got, I mean, you're all young, but it, you're, you're old enough to remember when not everybody used headphones. 
Yeah, see you later. Yeah, I'll catch you later. Bam, you're out. Now it's my problem to interrupt you listening to whatever you're listening to. The whole dynamic flipped. That's why marketing is so hard. Getting someone to f remember your brand really hard. Somebody to remember they might care about your brand, maybe take an action, harder. Write a check, give you cash, give you a debit card, give you a credit card. <whistles> Getting somebody to write to give you money. How many proposals have you done for clients and you walk out and you go, that was amazing. That was the best meeting ever. I don't know, sometimes, yeah. And how often it turns into, into a real project that turns into money is a pretty small percentage. So I just wanted to give you that perspective and with the time we have left, dig in deeper on entrepreneurialism and startups and innovation. But just to give you a perspective, and I won't keep going through this. I'll just stop there. But I wanted the chance just to open up the conversation about what it takes, what it is, what it isn't. Why would you start a business is really, really important because it's very, very hard on a lot of levels. So these are the, some of the words that come to mind for me when I talk about being an entrepreneur. But let's talk about what's good about it. So if you have a business or you're experimenting with one or you really want to have one or you dream about doing something in hotel management and restaurants and there's something in there that maybe you do want to do for yourself one day, what's really good about it? Doing anything on your own for yourself. So more independence. Everybody get that? Who else? Anybody? Yep, passion and do what you like. Life is really, really long. You always hear the phrase, life is short. If you don't get a terrible disease along the way, life is really, really long. You better do something you love. You get a chance to screw up four times before anybody notices. You could screw up four, maybe five times before you're 28 or 29, and no one cares, no one notices. You do not have to be right the first time. In fact, I'd say, please don't be right the first time. Keep evolving, whether it's your own business or what you're experimenting in your career. What else is great about it? So freedom, doing what you love. What else? Help me out. This is for you. Go ahead. Yeah. Something like accountability, yeah. right? Yep, everybody get that? Agree with that? Keep going. Anybody? Well, like making a difference. Making a difference, sure. So when you mold, you find a reasonable way to protect somebody's health and happiness. Yep. Yep. Certainly uh, financial success. Financial success, definitely. Yep. Yep. What's the percent of businesses that make it past a year? How small? In terms of, I don't remember the exact number. Is it like 20%? I think it's like 10 or 9%. Yeah, about 9 or 10%. So if I said to you, I have this amazing idea. You and I are going to go in business together, and let's have this guy join us. And we're going to take on the world, and we're going to make a million dollars, $10 billion, whatever your number is. And I said to you, all right, let's all take our money together, mom and dad's money, my money, friends, whatever. We're going to put it all in a pot, and we're going to start a business. And I said to you, 90% chance you're not going to be here in a year, and you're going to have no money. There's a part of you that probably say, ah, that doesn't sound great. My fallback position was living with my mother-in-law, which was amazing. I married into an Italian family. I never cooked. She did my laundry. It was incredible. <laughs> my downside risk, I had no kids. It was just my wife and me. I was like, this is amazing. Thank God that was the case. But if I said it to you that way, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but you really get smart about cash. And it makes you understand the risk, yeah. 
But your downside, I'm making this up, your downside risk would be like, I'm not going home. No way. I don't know your situation. I'm just making it up. I'm not going home. That's it. I'm out. I'm going to figure it out somehow, right? So the independence comes with risk. What else is positive? Our friend from Germany. What's positive about having a venture of some kind? Being your own boss. Yeah. At least for a while. <laughs> Until you get clients. <laughs> then they're the boss. <laughs> Anybody else? Sure. Uh, the opportunity to explore and expand yep. on Yep. To continue riffing and evolving an idea. Absolutely. You want to add anything to that? Given how much you see here? I think it's. Yep, so I'm with you on that. But you actually are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you're nuts. Why would you do that? I just told him he's going to fail 90% of the time. I'm doing this 29 years. I have no idea, really, why I'm still around. I just, I'm a really good listener. And like this conversation, I do with clients. Tell me what I can fix. Go. It's probably a little on the darker side, but the ability to consolidate power, in a sense, and actually make a direct personal impact on a world or a group that where you can command change. Yeah, man, that's great. Yeah, way. that you can actually consolidate power, not in an evil way necessarily, yeah, but like what you're saying. Me, like, you know what I'm fix, tired of that. Get fixed. Totally, I'm going to fix the problem. Totally. There's a lot that you read about people in science and research, like their sister had cancer or somebody got sick or passed away or something. Pardon me? Totally, yeah. Please. I think one of the things I found in the mold business is that satisfy my curiosity about so many different things, see the interrelationships of different yes. things, be able to make those connections, and give me a sense of self-fulfillment at the same yeah, time. Yeah, self-fulfillment, that's huge. How about you? Uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit about uh, community and the ability to make social impact. Yeah, so at the end of the day, it's not just, yeah, I, did, I sold stuff or I made stuff. Right. Like, I actually helped somebody. Yeah, it's tremendously satisfying. So let's talk about the negatives. I'll get, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. Tired all the time and <laughs> never get enough sleep. Tired all the time. I had to take a nap before coming here. OK, you can, you can sleep now if you want. <laughs> You're tired all the time. Uh, so how many years have you been doing it? I've been doing it in 10. How many years, sir? Four years. Four. Okay. Any other, any other people running businesses? How many years? Eight years. So I'm, I'm with you, and I'm 29, and I'm still exhausted. <laughs> I'm still exhausted. Every, every day I wake up, because I'm a night owl too, which I'm sure you guys are. <laughs> every day I wake up, I'm like, oh my god, I'm not, I, how do I get from here to that bathroom? There's got to be something other than stimulants that can get me there. It's really hard. Not a lot of sleep. Other negatives? Financial risks. Financial risk. That was a big one. Social pressure. Meaning if you screw up, everybody laughs at you? Meaning that everybody's telling you you can't do it. The, that pressure of, just go get a real job. I bet you coach a lot on that. Once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> what happens if I fail? Yeah. And one thing you mentioned. Just keeping your family relationships going. Uh, years ago, we had, um, when I was coming up, we had a family business, a delicatessen, and we found that nobody had time to spend with each other. We were always somebody else was there doing something, yeah. you never had time with each other. So that personal time, the personal contact with each other, it has an impact on your familial relationships. Mm -hmm. Your sister's not here, so we can. We could talk about that probably all day, how complicated that is for you. And respect to both of you, because you're doing it. It's all that matters. You just plow through, you know? Uh, I guess you'd say, like, learning who some people truly are, in the sense that, like, you know, there's, there's people, you know, that you might look up to, 
up to, or that those people that you trusted to have your back, and then it, you know you go make a simple request or yeah. that or whatever, and it kind of just not what you thought, right? How many people come to the hospital when you're in there on day two? Not day one when you get flowers and teddy bears. It's the second day after your car accident. Nobody calls. A week later, you were going to say something, sir? I was going to say, uh, for businesses, it takes a long time to turn a profit. So how do you like sustain yourself in the meantime? Cash. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the big mystery revealed. Revenue. Sorry. Sales, revenue, profit, cash, and cash flow. They are not the same thing. What is sales? Someone paid me a dollar. I sold them something, whatever it was, they paid me a dollar. Revenue, how much it cost me to make that dollar, right? If you had to grind it out on a manufacturing or you had to make something in graphic design or you're working on a software program or the, um, the young woman that was here about music, it cost, an in, in her case, an instrument, strings that break or lessons that she had to take or technology, profit. Building, overhead, heat, rent, chairs, computers. People get sick. They have babies. I always, <laughs> the joke in, a, in the company, I stopped saying this now a few years ago, but if you're going to have a baby, please let HR know before you decide to have one. <laughs> and we'll be gladly approved of that. You need approval. Not because we, we love babies and we want more of them, but boy, are they unproductive <laughs> in a business. <laughs> They're really hard. Cash, not the same as profit. What's cash? Anybody, what's cash? Well, I guess it's, oh, it's like how much liquid operational budget you have. So for example, uh, a company we've been talking with, I know Checkpoint Software, which is a really large cybersecurity vendor, they currently have 4.2 billion of liquid cash that they can spend on any type of investment they want. Yep, as long as they don't outgrow the 4.2. Right? Apple had $70, million, $70 billion in Ireland. Nobody was talking about until this country and this president decided it's time to start paying tax on the $70 billion. Sound like a good idea. I don't know. <laughs> $70 billion parked in Ireland? Good for Ireland. Cash is not the same as profit. Right? $100 less 20. That's my cost. Now I'm down. Uh, excuse me, this is a 20. Now I'm down to $80 in profit. How, how, what terms do your clients pay you in? How quickly? You send them a bill, how quick do they pay you? Uh, sometimes it, it, you know, it's like you're, doing a, you're doing a remediation job, you get part of it while the job is going, and the final portion, which is always contestable, is after the job is done. After the job is done, but you're still paid within a couple of weeks. Yes. Yeah, 30 days on the site license up front, and then uh, monthly SAS payment. Okay, okay. So now I'm paying bills when I have no cash, right? That's your point. Really hard, so you work harder. Cash. Cash is not the same as cash flow. What's the difference? Yep. Cash flow is how much you're getting in and out on the daily basis. That's right. I have a bucket of cash, but if I have a bad month and everybody, like I have a client that literally called last month and said, we're flipping our terms from 60 to 90 days. That's a brutal hit. So 30 less days I get paid than the month before. Now, it's fine. We have got plenty of cash, thank God. But right, the difference between cash and cash flow. So financial pressure is very real always measuring the difference between how much cash do I have and the cash flow that's coming in and out and what my um, opportunities are. That big project that sounded so amazing that you're not going to make any money on. Yeah, but we need clients. Yeah, but we'll never sell the next client unless we have a client. 
But if you lose money on that client, you're not going to have any money to do the next project. Yeah, yeah go ahead. How do you get the massive clients, like just these like large scale, like high profile clients that you get? It's like, do you have to have smaller clients beforehand? Yep. Just like a massive repertoire and like sell yep. them? Yep. Small clients, how much time? I'm out? Yep, a couple minutes. Okay. Small clients to medium sized clients, what happens is, Generally, small clients, people at small clients tend to stay at small clients. Small clients have a hard time making money. Very few small clients go to medium-sized companies. Medium-sized companies is where you can make money. Okay. Don't take a small client and lose money, because you'll never make money. And they, small client people tend to go to small client companies. If they quit, they just go to another small company. And I'm not judging that's bad or good, it's just reality. Big company people tend to stay at big companies. Yep? So you're saying for like companies starting out, don't aim too high, don't aim too low, like kind of just aim for like the middle ground where you can grow? Yep. Yeah, the big ones, the risk is too high. If you mess up, your rep is destroyed. I'm sorry, say? What would you consider like medium size? Depends what industry. It, yeah, I mean, my industry, there's lots and lots of companies that say they're marketing agencies. Lots of small. And there's, that's great because there's companies that need that. It depends on the industry. You'd have to really do your research. So like, um, oh yeah, you gotta go above thing. For like uh, graphic design, it would be something like, um, small would be something like a Kramer's and like a bit bigger over here would be like Wawa. And then yeah. above that designing for like, you know, like Coke or Pepsi or something. And can they pay their bills? Like, don't fear that question. There's a way to ask. But you got to ask. So what are your terms? Right, because you jump on that client. Oh, yeah, I got it. And then, oh, by the way, we pay in 90 days. Well, that's great. OK, I'm going to leave you with this. You, you have to be able to tolerate failure and risk constantly. It is very, very lonely. You will not have a lot of friends. You know a lot of people, but you don't have a lot of friends. The, owning a business and having friends unfortunately don't really go together. And a lot of times your friends are the people that you work with. And I would say constant curiosity. Just like keep evolving, keep going, going, move, 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 no matter what business you're in. Because if you don't, you'll just get wiped out. Somebody, somebody like you or you will be sitting in your basement working on the next amazing idea. And you'll say, ah, just like you said when you started, they won't notice. We'll be better, faster, smarter. And then there's better, faster, smarter right behind you that you don't know. That sounds like you. And you just didn't see it coming. Yeah. So I'd say the curiosity piece, if you had to pick one thing that I'm saying today and sharing just my own experiences, is that just continue, like, be obsessive about being better. And don't be afraid to ditch stuff that isn't working. Don't hang on to it. It's just wait. It costs you too much. That's it. I'm out. Thank you.